We're filming today in San Diego for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive, and I'm very pleased to have Jay Lenhart with me, who I'm going to say is one of the most in-demand bass players in New York City. Is that right? Well, <clears throat> I certainly uh, work a lot, and I know that a lot of people like me to play for them, so, mm -hmm. I, so I, yeah, I guess that's true. I mean, yeah. I don't want to be overly humble or anything, but uh -huh. at the same time, I think it's probably true. And yeah. What's a w working week like for you in New York City? Well, it's changed. Uh, I've been there for 30 years, uh, coming in and out. You know, I've been playing, uh, sometimes going on the road a little bit. But a, a week at its peak involved a lot of recording sessions. I had two kids, I still do as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. um, who are now 23 and 26 as of today, which is what, March 15th, uh, 8, February 15th, February, 1990. Yeah. Eight. Last the cameras, time I the cameras make you forget. <laughs> um, and they're 23 and 26, and they're they're uh, when they were young. I didn't want to leave them. Mm -hmm. uh, when we were uh, as we were, they were growing up, I didn't want to be an absentee father at all. I mean, not for their well for their sake, but mostly for mine. I enjoyed them so much. Uh -huh. It was one of the real joys of my life was having these great little kids around, and I just wouldn't leave. So I tried to entrench myself in whatever music I could in New York City and uh, nearby, and uh, I was lucky in that I got to be relatively busy as an electric bass player in the studios, and, uh, and learned to play it very well, you know, a lot of the f stuff. I mean, I, I loved it, I loved the instrument. It was, it was, it wasn't no f I wasn't faking, I did enjoy the mm -hmm. instrument. And still do, just don't play it anymore, because uh, you know, I'm 57 now, and there's not a lot of calls for an electric 57-year-old <laughs> bass player who plays, doesn't play half of what the guys are playing now. So, you know, it's a very limited position, yeah. I, I hope. Yeah. And, and so it's all right, because you know, I, I work a lot on, on, elect, on upright, which is what I started off as anyway, you know, from dust to dust. Right. And, uh, and, so, and, and really, I express myself much more fully on, on uh, upright bass. And I do a lot of sessions. I don't do as many now. There just aren't as many sessions now for some reason. The, the, the business is scattered out. They don't use as many live musicians. And um, the writers are younger, and they use their friends who are younger. So I don't get as much of the work. But I, nonetheless, I still seem to do an awful lot around New York. Mm -hmm. yeah. What kind of recording sessions would you have done on the electric bass? Was it uh, TV shows? Uh, TV shows and jingles. Lots of commercials. Yeah. All those innocuous things. Crest commercials and uh -huh. and so forth and so on. Half of them, a lot of them, I did. You know. Um, so at any moment, you could hear yourself on the television. Unfortunately, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, well, actually, you know, it's funny. On electric bass, you didn't hear yourself so well because um, they they always put you down in the mix. So you say, I think I played that commercial, but you couldn't. You can't. So I started playing the, the first really big uh, commercial I did on upright bass was a Mazola commercial. Mazola is the da 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 And they started really using upright bass in, in a 4-4 jazz situation. I remember the date. It was like uh, 1985, around August of 1985. And that commercial became a big hit, and everybody said, you know, upright bass is good. <laughs> and so they started using it, and started bringing it way up in the mix, and suddenly you could hear yourself on all the commercials. And... Uh, um, and they really wanted somebody who could play real jazz, who really knew his way around the instrument, and um, they used me anyway. Uh -huh. no. Uh, <laughs> no one else was available. Right, right? no one else was available. <laughs> so, uh, so, so I got to be, I got to be busier and busier, and I stayed around New York and, and uh, had a. People knew me, and so I, I just started making enough money in the commercials to, uh, to, to hang around and play the jazz gigs at night. Yeah. And, Occasional Broadway show, although I, I could, I didn't like that. I'm too much a ham to be in the pit. Right. Really, I like to be on the stage where people are saying, "Oh, that's the music. I'm here to hear that music. That music's not to accompany that over there." Yeah. Right. I, I came to hear that music, so that's sort of why I did it. That's why I'm here this weekend. You know, well, I can tell you're a bit of a. You like to be on stage. I yeah. can tell by watching you. Sure. And we'll talk about your songs uh, in a moment. I understand. No, let's you, talk. I'm talking about them now. Oh, right. Talk about no, your songs right now. No, no, don't. I'm just being. Now I can't get started again. Let's see. No, I and understand you studied uh, banjo at the Peabody Conservatory. Is that right? No, that's a good. That's a good. That's a pretty good uh, misquote. That this, folks, is how things get misquoted. When I get accused of studying banjo at Peabody, you can see now 
the trouble we have. They didn't have a banjo major at Peabody. No kidding. No. Oh Eddie, Eddie, right. I played piano at Peabody. Oh. And I was six years old, and I studied there. This was in 1946. My mother used to send me downtown on the bus by myself. It was perfectly safe. There was a statue in downtown Baltimore of a guy riding a horse, an English guy riding a horse with his arm out like this. My mother said, when you see the horse and the guy pointing, Peabody's right, he's pointing right at Peabody. Get off the next block. I did, it was fine. The only trouble was, is I, for whatever reason, didn't like to practice. I hated to practice the piano. I liked to play the piano. I didn't like to read. I had a block against learning to read. I just couldn't figure out what that was about. Mm -hmm. So I got to making up parts and things. And the teachers would say, that sounds nice, but what is that thing, thing in the middle there? And I'd be making, up some, making something up to, to bridge the part that I knew to another part that I knew with the part <laughs> that I didn't know. And that, I was sort of improvising. You know, I really was improvising. Uh -huh. And I, then I finally just couldn't take it. I, I hated going in the the lessons at that eight years old, unprepared. I felt so terrible. I felt like such a bad boy. Uh -huh. I hadn't done my work, and I hadn't. So I finally cried my way out of the, um, the lessons. I just, I, I'd like to think I was seven. I was probably 14. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> no, but it was real early. And, I, and Mrs. Watson, Miss Watson finally said, this is too much stress on him. No more piano lessons. So fine, I stopped studying piano, didn't touch the piano. Then Arthur, all of a sudden, Arthur Godfrey came on television in about 1947-48, teaching ukulele. And I got smitten, mm. seriously smitten, um, with the boom, ding, boom, look at that beautiful sound of the strings. Boom, look. It just sounded so beautiful to me. And now it sounds kind of, it still does sound very pretty to me. And uh, Remo Palmieri was, t was on television teaching Arthur Godfrey how to play. Remo Palmieri is a wonderful guitar player who now still lives in New York, who I've since worked with a number of times. Okay. You know, and we're very That's good cool. friends. Uh, so I got interested in string music, banjo plucking. My brother immediately, my older brother saw that I liked the ukulele. He took the ukulele and mastered it in two seconds. I mean, he is the brilliant one. <laughs> and I said, well, what happened to my ukulele? All of a sudden, I was playing second ukulele and plunking along. And he was playing all the lead. And I really liked it. I became a very good rhythm player, listened, listening to rhythms and harmonies and stuff. Took up banjo, studied, studied guitar. I studied, played it. Um, then, about 14, took up the bass, because I mm -hmm. saw, heard it in a Dixieland band, and I realized, here was my road to freedom. Was the Dix was, uh, I could play my own instrument, didn't have to be my brother's lackey. Okay. Uh, he's playing all the lead, and I can't even play a solo on tenor banjo. I'm just, I'm never asked to, so I never learned to do anything except go blink, 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 uh -huh. blink, 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 blink. <laughs> and I was pretty good at that. I mean, I de developed a wonderful sense of time from it, you know, really strong sense of where the time should be. Uh, trying to play good chords and stuff like that. And I was playing bass lines all the time. I was playing... Mm -hmm. Kind of like Marty Gross, th that, exactly. that style of... Exactly, exactly. And then the, the bass came along and Ray Brown entered my life with, with the Oscar Peterson at the Stratford Shakespearean Festival. The record, I think they recorded in 52. And that became the holy grail. That became the, the reason for living was that music for me. I mean, it's amazing how powerful that music was to me. I never heard anything swing like that. I never heard arrangements like that. Freedom, joy, everything. Expressed everything that I wanted out of this life was in that record. So I quickly, uh, I bought it and listened to it thousands of times. It really became, I became so centered on that music that it became really the center of my musical experience. Everything that was happening, Bop, Charlie Parker, I didn't care about that. Can you remember the, the, the very first time you heard that Oh, I take clearly, the recording. clearly. Yeah. Uh, John Eaton, the piano player in Washington, who you may or may not know, the, he's a wonderful solo pianist, and he works. He, he does a lot of concerts for the Smithsonian Institute, mm -hmm. and he's a brilliant piano player. Uh, he made the, me aware of this record, and he sat down and he said, "You've got to hear this." I said, "Okay." Mm -hmm. I sat down and listened to it, and you know, like I said, it really. That was it. That. Well, it sure showed me what what that bass instrument was could be about. Uh -huh. uh, the sound, the drive, the beauty—it just overwhelmed me. And so I listened and listened, and it, it to this day, uh, the way that Ray, the sound that Ray Brown got on that record, is is to me the way I want the bass to sound. And you know, 
sometimes I accuse myself, well, why don't you become an original? Why don't you do, and in many ways I'm very original. I write mm -hmm. my own songs, I do a lot of things. I don't play the same notes that Ray plays. I have a lot, of, I, but boy, I'm telling you, this, the spirit of his playing uh -huh. very much permeates my own, and he knows it. When he and I have become good friends, I went up to study with him, and, and I'll tell him blatantly, I can't help it if you just played that well. I mean, you, any more than he can help if Blanton played that well, and he copied Blanton, yeah. and he admits, he just, he heard Blanton, and he said, I gotta do that, but then Ray started swinging it more. Well, I heard Ray, and I said, oh, that's how the bass has got to sound. And I naturally fell into my own way of playing, and I, I find more, I find I'm really influenced by Oscar Pettiford, the melodic, the melodicness of, the, the melodicness, what's the word I'm looking for? The melodious? Melodiousness, the, uh, that's worse. <laughs> yeah, right. We know what you mean. But, but his melodic thinking, uh -huh. and he had a different approach than Ray did, of course. And, uh, but I liked lines that really tied together, that that really expressed an idea that didn't have to stop halfway through because technically you couldn't find what the next note you were trying uh -huh. to say. Even if it's simple, just real notes. I mean, like Jerry Mulligan, listen to Jerry Mulligan. What ma makes him outstanding is, is he learned to use the lower register and he understood the sonic thing on the, on the baritone. And so he played melodies on the baritone that nobody else hmm. quite played. But, you know, it was all different stuff. But he had a mel melodiousness to his playing that you just, it just comes through every time you hear. You hear him two seconds, you know it's Jerry Mulligan on the, on the baritone. Because there's a, a son sonor, I don't know any words. By a dictionary learn words like sonorous, melodicness, melodicticity, <laughs> melodicity, and use them. So someday when you do an interview, you can They'll just seem come literate. right out. <laughs> yes. It was very sonorous. Sonor uh, I don't know. I wasn't prepared for this. I was no, you know. Um, and I'm so a writer. When you got into the bass, and what did you feel was the, in addition to learning to physically play it and get that part down, the technique, did you then realize that there was a whole repertory of tunes that you had to get into? And how did you go about that? Boy, I was speaking to Bucky Pizzarelli about this yesterday. He and I were of a generation, we never sat down and learned music. We heard it on the radio. We heard all the songs on the radio that anybody ever played. They were the pop songs of the day that became the jazz standards of, the, of you know, later on. And I had never sat down and studied a song. I'd always heard it on the radio. I mean, oh, well, I might write out some substitute changes for it, but I would hear, you hear so much jazz and you heard so many versions of it, that, that you knew 27 different substitutes for every song anyway, I rarely sat down and studied hmm. songs because I'd heard them all. They were, they, most people did pop songs. Then, of course, when people started writing jazz songs, which in the bop era, they started really writing, well, I guess before that, but as far as I was concerned, that's when they really started writing bop. But even then, you heard, somehow you heard those. Hmm. Okay, and a bass player didn't have to study the leads to these things, which I'm now, spending much more time doing just as a solo player to be able to walk up and, and to be able to do a solo version of a Charlie Parker song on just bass and try to make it interesting. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's great practice for me. That's the way I practice now is to, is to do that. Play the melodies. Is to play the melody and then try to, try to accompany the melody like, you know, you know, take like um, Donna Lee and, and tear it apart. And mm -hmm. don't just play the melody, but also accompany it and try to find ways to make it interesting on the bass. Meanwhile, you're using your ear and you're, you're solving all kinds of problems and melodic uh, intervals and things. Yeah. And, uh, and, and playing melodies is good because you, you're forced to play stuff that you wouldn't think of in a solo situation on the bass. You, you know, solo-wise, you're going to play something that you can play. But all of a sudden, you've got to play the melody. You're forced into learning other things. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to play classical melodies because I don't, I don't, I, I'm not going to use them mm -hmm. unless they're really fascinating to me. I'd rather play something that I really want to hear. So. so like all the things you are, tunes like that, you know, the, the stuff from the real book yeah. or, or the third of it that people yeah. really play, yeah. those tunes were being played on the radio by artists. Oh, you heard so them constantly. You, just, you, you heard just them constantly. It. I mean, don't forget pop radio in those days, in, in the 40s and 50s, this was, you know, I mean, in the 40s, all it was was, was big bands and, mm -hmm. and maybe, um, you know, some of the corny pop songs. You know, uh, I don't want to put anybody down. Like Rosie Clooney's a good friend of mine, but her, 
her, uh, oh, hey, uh, not hey there, come on to my house, my house, oh, come yeah. on, you know, songs in that category, which seemed to be the pop. But in spite of that, there was all these wonderful songs from Broadway and the standards and Irving, you know, Berlin and Porter and everybody. That's what's all you heard on the radio. Mm -hmm. And you got to know those songs in inherently. So the real book, you look at it, you laugh. I mean, you, 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 you grew up hearing those songs. So I, I, that's what I don't envy about guys who have to, these days, they gotta, they gotta sit and really work to get that music, <laughs> yeah. you know. Uh, but then they become very w well rounded because now they're, they're, into, they're into all the styles of music too. They're hearing all the music of the day, you know, so they're, I mean, jazz is always evolving, uh, hopefully, and, yeah. and changing, so. Eventually you went to New York. Yeah, I went to New York in 1960. No, 60. No, 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 that's not right. 61. Mm -hmm. I went uh, up to Oscar Peterson School in Toronto in 60. I remember turning 21 in a little apartment on a cold winter night in Toronto on <laughs> yeah. December 6th. All of a sudden, I said, I'm 21. Oh. I bought myself a quart of beer and uh, <laughs> celebrated. And, uh, uh, Moved Mike Longo, the pianist, who you may well know, he and I had a trio with a German named Jimmy Young. And we moved to um, New York together in April of 61. Started working at the Playboy Club. And. Um, Was there a pretty fierce competition uh, for, for gigs like that? Well, I guess there was, but. but uh, we were some pretty capable players at that point, and we had, we were young, we were able to put up with the hours, and somehow we got the gig. Mm -hmm. And and oh, there's lots of musicians working in New York, you know, I mean, there was plenty of guys. Gee, in 1960, it was a very busy period. And still is, it's still very busy, you know, I mean, uh, but we, we got our jobs, and we, and I could play reasonably well, so I could, so when I play with people, they, a lot of them wanted me to play with them again, and that's the key, you know, you know somehow they say, Let's use that bass player again. The band sounded good. Or let's use that. Yeah. Somehow, if you can get that going, you're gonna. Yeah, you know, you're on your way to uh, starving. Right? <laughs> you're well on your way to starving. Well on your way to starving as a musician. <laughs> you know, you work those gigs that you cannot possibly afford to make a living at. You know, but you know you have to find a way, and that's the thing about the music. You just have to find a way to make a living at it. What was a a club date paying in the early '60s? Well, I think that the the I think the, I went on the road, let me see, I went on the road with Woody, not with Woody Herman, with Buddy Mara's band in 1959, 60, for 150 a week, mm -hmm. and saved almost all of it. Came back with more money than I ever had in my life. Then I went to New York, I think I was making 150 a week mm -hmm. in 1961. You know, I mean, whatever it came to a night, it was six nights, so. I was, and I was paying rent. I mean, my apartment was uh, 150 a month. I had six rooms, five rooms on Riverside Drive for 150 a month, and I could have kept it. I could have kept it, and today it would be, I, it would be 600. Uh, but I gave it up and uh, left New York in 1963. I had been, really, I had been drinking too much. I, you know, I was a kid, and I, I just yeah. wasn't in shape for that kind of thing. And I was, messing around and drinking. And so I left unhappy in 63 and went back to Baltimore, started working for my father, and then realized that I started working in the insurance business with my father and his company. And we, I went to a sales course and I realized, wait a minute, you can't be drunk and you can't be drugged and sell life insurance. You just are not gonna do it. It finally dawned on me, boom. And I said, you probably can't play music well either in that condition. Boom. And it took me four years to really stop drinking, really, you know, start taking care of myself, which I did. And in 1967, I moved back to New York. I really wanted to play. I didn't want I, I knew I didn't want to. And I was completely sober. Mm -hmm. And I was able to really tackle the difficulties of earning a living as a musician. And, uh, you know, besides the fact that you're in nightclubs so much and that you're around booze, and do you think that there's an attitude with some musicians that you kind of need to be high 
uh, and s on some substance or another to play jazz. Yeah, yeah sure. I mean, I, I know guys, very good musicians, who, who at times in their lives have really felt that they played much better, drunk, high, whatever. And I understand that. I understand that. But you know, you know, you know, it's, it's hard to last like that. It's very tough on your system. Mm -hmm. you, you know, and drinking is a perilous thing because it's it really takes it out of you. You know, and you have that one little drink. And you have just that one little drink and. You're in a club and somebody wants to buy you another and say, oh no, I've had my drink. Oh no, no, I'm not going to. Of course you're going to have a drink. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Ups, well, one, another night down the drain. And uh, if you're really serious about him, it's like an astronomer. He's going to go up and look at the stars. Well, let's have a few drinks first. No, you want to see the stars. You want to see, you want to be able to look. If you're interested, that's just, you don't want to be drunk. You want to really look at what you're doing. Well, with playing music, Hopefully, it might be the same thing, mm -hmm. you know. And it, for me, it, 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 it has been for the last 30 years. I mean, I don't mean to be preachy about it, but yeah. I don't care. Good words. Uh, the list of people you've played with uh, since then is most impressive. Jerry Mulligan you played with, yeah. and Sebesky and Phil Woods. Yep, yep. I play, well, in New, being in New York and being in the studios and being available, really available, I've had a chance to work with everybody. I mean, just about everybody. I mean, Miles Davis was one of the few I didn't work with. I could name a, uh -huh. you know, small list of uh, people who I never got a chance to play with. But in one capacity or another, either in the studios or a, a, a one-nighter, uh, subbing for somebody, uh, steadily working steadily, I've had a chance, or re recording, I've really had a chance to work with a lot of people mm -hmm. and learn and hear a lot of music and and. Uh, and like. your children were born about, uh, uh, let me think here, late 70s? Well, uh, my daughter Carolyn was born in 1971. My son Michael was born in 1974. Okay. And that's when you started to, was your, was your um, pickup of the electric bass, uh, no pun intended, that was about that time that you No decided, pun taken. No. <laughs> thank you. Um, is that about the same time? Did that happen because you wanted to stay home more and the electric bass became something you needed to do? Well, you know, I never made any real courageous decisions about staying home. It's just sort of little teeny decisions. Uh, I took up the electric bass when I was 12 in 1952. Oh. Bought, a less, bought a humbugger, a Gibson humbugger, because I was, I don't know, somehow or other, I, I, I just bought one and my brother and I were doing a little bit of fooling around with it. And it was in my guitar days, but before I took the upright up. So I played it, and I said, yeah, I can play this. And I was sort of playing it, you know, and uh, then put it away, then moved to New York, and all of a sudden heard Aretha Franklin and Jerry Jamat and uh, I guess Chuck Rainey playing. I said, no, I like that. That's good electric playing. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is boom, 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 I said, yeah, I, I could get into that now. So I got an electric bass, and I realized they were doing a lot of commercials and, all, and the recording business was mostly on electric bass in New York, even in 1967 when I moved back to town. And uh, I guess I just said, I gotta buy one. I know I can play it. I know I got the basics of it done. So I took a couple gigs where, at night where I worked just playing electric bass, electric bass, like, and my upright chops went out the window, but I didn't care because nobody was calling you to play. And on those days, jazz is sort of taking a deep dive underground. Uh -huh. I mean, um, uh, People, the public just lost it. it uh, jazz got so complex and convoluted, and and nobody was playing swing anymore. Nobody was playing simple songs that, that, that non-jazzers could understand. So the public said, "Well, forget jazz, rock and roll. That's what we like. Yeah. We like rock and roll." Yeah. And so, so excuse me. For, so what happened was, is pop music started taking on the the characteristics of early jazz. All of a sudden, there was Aretha was. I mean, there's just certain areas of pop music were starting to take over where early jazz had been so communicative, suddenly, uh, to me, pop music was starting to do this. And, and then all of a sudden, so in the 70s, it was, jazz was in a, in, in a very underground state. And then, in, in my opinion, the guy who caused it to turn around, now this, I, you'd never guess in the thought, but in my opinion, it was Scott Hamilton. He started playing jazz that people could relate to. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden, his music became very popular. Swing jazz. He, he's, you know, came in also sort of like Lester Young and yeah. started playing like this. And I watched this tremendous resurgence occur 
right around the time that he was really getting popular. Uh -huh. Now, I know it's a silly thing to say, but it seems like the people will say, oh, nonsense. Um, uh, the saxophone player whose name I've just blocked out. Uh, the last of the boppers. Uh, uh, Played on the, practiced in the in Brooklyn Bridge. Oh, Sonny Rollins. Sonny Rollins. I wonder why I can't think of Sonny Rollins. He was playing all the time, but he had sort of gone underground. I mean, people didn't hear these people. Coltrane was dead, I think, already, and and uh, so all of a sudden, people like Stan Getz and and Scott Hamilton and Zoot Sims were sort of becoming heroes again, and it was very communicative, easy to understand music. Mm -hmm. And the public said, oh, all right, I can understand that. So a lot of people who didn't know could understand it, so they started to embrace it again. And uh, then along comes Winton, who's, gee, I mean, he, he, on one level, he's play, playing his far out music. On another level, he's playing so far in, you know, uh, uh, New Orleans music, March music, you know, and, and God bless him, you know, I yeah. mean, uh, and, so, and a lot of the young guys today are very much traditionalists. You know what I mean? They're acoustic bass and they're playing. Yeah. yeah I mean, they, you know, they have the all modern touch to it, a very modern touch and a very technical, uh, great expertise. But jazz has sort of said, people sort of said, well, we got to communicate. If we don't communicate, we're going to get lost. We're really going to starve. Yeah, you know, because there's a couple people who will get away with going out in front of huge audiences and getting out. There's always a couple people who can get away with it. That everybody else says, hey, I'm going to do that, and they can't get an audience because the audience says, oh, yeah, come on. <laughs> you know, we're, we're being very kind here. You know, we, we don't understand what's going on, but these are stars. So it goes, it goes, like everything, it pushes the envelope, and then people go, they don't understand it. And so I'm just looking at it from the, from the you know, from my parents' standpoint, you mm -hmm. know, the people and people who buy this stuff. You know, we only sell 3% of the records in the country. Yeah. You know, so, uh, so who's buying what, you know, and... Uh, if you want to make a living, and I'm not saying sell out. I, God knows, look at, my, look at my kids; they're they're not selling out, and they're they're finding out what it's about. You know, they're doing their own music now, and they're my son's put out two records already. No and, kidding! And, yeah. they, and he's got wonderful reviews, and he sold 11 records. You know? Yes. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and uh, uh, what does he play? He plays trumpet. You know, he yeah. oh, he was a he in this he graduated from school in the from music and art in 1992, won a Grammy. He's the outstanding musician in the country. What the Grammy? The, People, uh, Naris, uh, the people who give Grammys, did a contest, and he won this big award. He was also a presidential scholar for, in some other area, for being an art in the arts. So bingo, they put him on. He was oh, some person of the week on ABC News. This 18-year-old kid. You know, uh, now that you mention it, I I know I've seen his name yeah. in, in the trades or whatever, and I didn't make the connection. Right, and he went around the world with this U.S. the, the, the Philip Mars Super Band, and he was getting more publicity than you can imagine. All of a sudden, he's a songwriter, a singer, a pianist, a guitar player, a drummer. And all kinds of things, and a beautiful trumpet player, but he's just like spread out to here right now. Uh -huh. So he's working. He, he's finding his way with music that's extremely expressive, sometimes out, sometimes in, but it's gorgeous stuff. I mean, I find it gorgeous stuff. Yeah. So he's going to find out his way yeah. in the world. And my daughter is a singer, and she's. They, we were both out with Steely Dan, for instance, two years ago. They both cool. did a world tour with Steely Dan, and they're good. I mean, trust the prejudiced father. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. <You know? laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, they're, they're trying to find their way. I don't know. Where are we going with this conversation? Well, do you compare songwriting with, uh, uh, do you compare your songs with your son? Do you guys get together and... Oh, all the I time. Mean, all the time. We talk, we don't try to write songs like each other, but, but I, I, I listen to his stuff and, I, and it leaks through what he, yeah. you know, what, you know, he's being as original as he can be, but I hear myself all the time in there in uh -huh. a certain way, but he's very original. Yeah. So, uh, uh, we actually, we don't talk technique of songwriting at all, mm -hmm. at all. We talk about the soul of the songwriting, writing about what's on your mind, uh, you know, uh, enjoying it. You know, it's it's like a professional hobby with both of us. You know, we're both very dedicated to it. And, uh, and he sees what I've done. I mean, I've, I just don't write pop songs. I just write stuff that's really on my mind, whether it's serious or mm -hmm. joking. And sometimes joking is very serious to me. You know, yeah. I mean, it just is. That's just how I express myself. So. Uh, when did you first get into saying, you know, have an urge to 
do your own songs? So, well, I, I writ, wrote poetry in high school as a sort of a way to communicate to friends and have fun. Mm -hmm. um, and I found out I could write a limerick pretty easy. Well, it's not that hard to do. The English language does have some rhymes in it. And if you think about it, you can find them. Um, then uh, around the 30s, all of a sudden, I just the kids were born, and I wrote a sort of a Sesame Street song that I liked. A little silly and sappy and all that kind of stuff, but I liked it. Then, the, then, uh, then the, the, we had the big gasoline shortage, I think in 73 or 74, I mean a yeah. big one. Yeah. And I wrote, uh, I'm 13th in line at the filling station waiting to pick up my weekly ration of gasoline, bum bum, from a big machine. And I wrote a country song that actually got uh, a little bit of airplay in the country, in, in the East. And uh, I had a lot of fun putting it together and enjoyed the little bit of publicity. I said, you know, this publicity can help you in your music career. <laughs> you know, so. I said, you know, it can, it, it can really not be a bad thing. You know, you can get work, people know your name, and you might work in all sort of peripheral areas, and even as a jazz bassist, you know. So, um, so, so pursuing and promoting the songs was not something I didn't want to do. Loved writing them. Um, found it was um, something I just, uh, the challenge, the fun of actually performing the songs, uh, that you can actually earn a living at it. Mm. Uh, it's very expressive and everything. I mean, it just became like a hobby that I really loved pursuing and felt very good when I was doing it, you know. And what about the first time you decided you could deliver them yourself? Well, I automatically assumed I was going to deliver them myself. Oh. I didn't think anybody was going to write through them for me. Uh -huh. I, just, I never even thought that uh, I would be a songwriter for other people. Hmm. Okay, I so. thought whatever level I get to achieve at this, I will do it. I will perform my own music and anybody who hears them wants to do them is free to do them. Right. But. Uh, uh, and as a result, I have not spent any time, comparatively speaking, promoting my own music, which is a, a mistake uh, in terms of economic, although I have e survived economically, so maybe it's not such a big mistake. I didn't get rich. If that's a sin, well, then that's the sin. You know. but, uh, but I do have a lot of, I'm working a, consistently at it now. I've got a show coming up on Broadway this fall. Uh, I'll be in it on off Broadway, and hopefully it'll move up to Broadway. Right. We'll see what level we're going to get it to, but it's yeah. seriously produced of all my own music, just cool. a story weave through, of which I've taken a, a list of about 150 songs that I've written, and then picked the ones wow. that I really love, that have something to say, uh -huh. that are funny, that are poignant, that don't just—I mean, they really, to, to my way of thinking, have something to say. Excuse me, as I bang the mic again, that have something to say, and and turn them into a. a a song with a little bit of chatter in between to sort of tie things together, or maybe not. But it's easy to sort of find a way of, a way of weaving it and not make it uh, so totally self-centered, you know, but nonetheless, it's, you know, it's about the world, life, science, uh, <laughs> yeah. photon splitting, all kinds of songs. <laughs> I mean, I have a lot of songs. And, and, and we've done a couple run-throughs run of it, uh -huh. or is it runs-through? Yeah. Run-throughs <laughs> run or runs-throughs? Runs-throughs. Oh, I, speaking, I figured out something the other day. Now, did you know that the word the should be pronounced the probably in front of a, of a, of a vowel and the in front of a consonant? Give me an example. For the article or the article. Uh -huh. The article is hard to say, the article, uh -huh. but the article, just the article. The ball is the ball. <laughs> and, and, pick any, and you'll find that in the English language, when you want to, something that flows nicely, the should be pronounced the in front of vowels, vowels, and the in front of consonants. And I'm just walking through now, I'll probably have to write a song about that. Because no one, I was never in an English book, was it? Did you ever read that in English no, book? No, I never did. But in, pronunci in terms of pronunciation, it always makes sense that it should be the lamp, the book, the aardvark. Well, the aardvark, see, the aardvark is hard yeah, to say, but right. the aardvark just, the aardvark. Well, the uh, the uh, because the e to the a. The ideas you have are quite fascinating. Right. Thank you. See, see, you've caught on immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Even better than I hoped. <laughs> I'm going to try that in my next song. Actually, it does flow nice, and uh, I expect to, if I see your show on Broadway, I expect the singers will be 
using that. No, I'll, I'll probably be the only singer. I'll probably be the, the, okay. But I, I think I have to write a song about that because it's a very good yeah. idea. Yeah, yeah. It's, just it's, just it's to, let, to let America in on how to speak, you know, how, how right. we speak our language. Well, when you did your thing um, last night, your set last night, you know, I mean, it's really, it's a, my opinion at these, at these parties, it was a, a great change of pace. It was really something different. Um, Really enjoyed it. Well, thank you. And in the, and the, um, just the vocal note with your bass line. Those two things moving. Great, yeah, great I, stuff. I enjoy it. You know, if you can get it, if you can get it to sound decent, you can have a lot of fun with just those, being the uh, top and the bottom of Bach, leaving right. the middle two yeah. lines to someone else. You know, you're, yeah. you're the vocal, you're the lead and the bass. And, um, uh, I mean, I've done concerts of just myself. Yeah. And it's great fun. And and I. I Gotten, not gotten a bad review from it because you got to do awfully interesting material. However, you know you got to uh -huh. find ways to to make it very interesting for the audience because you're going to walk out there with a bass. For, so you got to have some interesting patter and and have some fun and mm -hmm. and keep the songs flowing so they don't their ears don't get totally exhausted by bass voice, bass voice, bass voice. So you got to find ways to get around things. <laughs> and having Kenny Poplowski play with me, of course, is what yeah. a player, what yeah. a sound he gets out of that clarinet. Yeah, what a sound. Excellent. These jazz parties are, um, when was the first time you I did think, a jazz party? I think the first one I ever did was Ottercrest, uh, which you, I don't know if you ever, you ever heard of Ottercrest? No. Oh, it's a wonderful one. It was, up in, it was up in Salem, Oregon, run by Bill and Mary Brown. And it was in this gorgeous setting overlooking the Pacific. What a beautiful party. And, and uh, all of a sudden, all these wonderful players come from all over, and we get together in this idyllic little the uh, resort sitting overlooking the Pacific and there's seals down on the rocks down below and stuff and just that the, 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 the northern, northern coastline of northern California, Oregon coastline, which is overwhelming to a person from the east who's never really seen that, mm -hmm. how different and how expansive and beautiful it is. And all these musicians from the west coast would come up and the guys from the east coast would get together and they'd have some really good sets. I mean, it wasn't just traditional music, it was a lot of real swing or it never got past really swing. I mean, a little bop, maybe, you know, it never got modern, modern. Mm -hmm. uh, but, the, you know, they're catering to the audience, you know, which at that time was uh, mostly uh, white people from 50, 50 on, you know, so, you know, you play the music they want if you want customers, you know, it's right. just the old customer thing, you know. Well, as it is at most of them. Right, you're right, you right. See, in fact, you see a lot of the same faces. Oh. This, yes, yes. You know, yes. they make the circuit. And they're getting older. Yeah. And they're dying off. And uh, I don't know what's going to be with this kind of thing. But, you know, it's all right. There's no younger faces here. There's no yet younger people getting interested in this music. And, uh, but they're, they're certainly interested in their music. You know, there's lots of music they're interested in. So we'll see what happens. I suspect there will always be a market for those of us who wish to play Mm -hmm. uh, this, I mean, this the music that we're playing in this festival isn't exactly my cup of tea either, you know, I mean, uh, I'm, I, while I love how, you know, can you miss New Orleans, to, what's the song, da 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 to miss New Orleans, do you know what it means to miss New Orleans? I can't play that every night now, you know, I mean, uh, this is the, this, this homage to older jazz is, is uh, gets a little tiresome to me. Um, but then it's all right because the players are great. Every once in a while, it's fun to play that, I guess. And, yeah, yeah. And and watch the the group on stage work things out. You know, I mean, there's a lot of horn players up there. Yeah, and, and these guys, these guys know. Uh, you know, I'm not just saying it to uh, c cover my bases, cover my tracks here, <laughs> yeah. but but these guys are very good. I yeah. mean, Paplowski and well, I guess you maybe use no sense listening to them, but they're all very good players, and it's been a lot of fun. They know what they're doing. These are, these are the pros of the pros in this business downstairs mm -hmm. right now. They, they know just how to do it. Well, you've got a, a play in the future, a musical, and um, got any recording plans coming up soon? Yes, yes. I, uh, I um, have a very ambitious project for myself. I, I'm just getting into you know into computerized recording now, uh, and I'm going to create a whole series of recordings of just bass, solo bass, uh, 
of songs of Ellington, of this, of that, and the other thing, of uh, different styles of music. I'm going to take some also some classical themes and, and work on them uh -huh. and see if I can play the classical themes and then find accompaniments to them, improvise the accompaniments to them. Oh. And, and it's stuff that, songs that I really love from the classics, you know, I mean, uh, as well as um, Gershwin and Porter and everybody else. I put out a long series of records, put them out myself, of bass solos on these things. Because, you know, bass solos are funny things. If they're, if they're communicative, they find their way onto the air. Disc jockeys will play them. No kidding. The, the jazz guys will play the uh, bass solo every once in a while. They'll, they'll just for the fun of it, stick it on. Uh -huh. Then I want to do a whole lot of new songs of my own with my, probably my son accompanying me mostly because he's such a good keyboard player. And, and uh, so I've got a lot of recording projects. Just, you know, uh, big commercial plans in the recording world. No, I don't see any reason for it. I don't mm -hmm. see. I don't see what. Uh, I don't understand how I could possibly pull it off. You know, I mean. Uh, but I'll just keep doing my music, make it as good as I can, and and I will try to sell it a little bit more efficiently. You know, to the internet and stuff like that, and oh, try yeah. to try to become a better salesman. Uh, as long as it doesn't stress me out too much. Right. Know, maybe I'll just let other people. It's almost a whole job in itself yeah. to to do that kind of thing, but. You seem to have uh, been very successful in finding a number of niches yes. in the world of music. I think so. I think and, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've got record companies who still sell all six of my CDs now. Yeah. I'm great. still talking to all the presidents of them, and the records are still in the market, and uh -huh. they still sell. And I've got uh, deals coming up in the future, you Excellent. know, uh, just some, some other stuff. And, of course, with Bucky and John, and uh, Bucky Pizzarelli and John Bunch, the, the group that got called New York Swing, that's really a remarkable group to me. Uh, um, I like this group very much, just piano, bass, and guitar. Mm. And it's a very interesting combination of older music, newer music, but all swinging and, and yeah. beautifully arranged. And, and uh, these guys can play. Yeah. These guys can I play. Just, to me, there's nothing like that, that chunking, opa, what do they call it, the hollow body, yeah, rhythm that, guitar. I mean, that just... That Freddie Green rhythm. Yeah. Well, you know, well, Bucky, Bucky is a master. Bucky is a master of that. Yeah. And it's also the notes he, he puts on top of the chord, too. I, I've noticed, a, a, the, in fact, I want to talk about Mel Tinton a little bit. That He was on a Dick Hyman record that I just think is great. And it wasn't just the, the chunking. It was the note as it moved on the top of the chord. Dun, 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 dun. Well, you know, that I'll voice tell you, leading I'll thing. tell you a little secret. Most of the time, there's one note in the chord. Most of the time, Bucky's doing, he's uh, dampening most of the notes and playing one, he's playing the third or the seventh. Wow. You listen carefully. There's not six notes, five notes, five. there's not even three notes. At best, there's two wow. notes. That's two cool. notes coming through, and the rest of it is chunk, 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 yeah. chunk, giving it that sensational comp, you know, combination of a, of a drum, chunk, uh -huh. chunk, chunk. He's the simplest guy, and that's why he can play any song at all. He doesn't have to know all the, the, the upper partials of it. You know, uh -huh. he, he, on his solo playing, he'll play all the upper partials of it. But when he's playing rhythm guitar, and that's the key to it, that's why it sounds so good, because it's not, get, it's not noty and full of... And mm -hmm. that's what rhythm guitar players today, young guys who, who play, will pick up a Martin and play, play you know, steel string and start playing rhythm guitar on it, they're trying to play all the notes, and yeah. it's, they don't understand. It doesn't sound good. It's way too thick. Yeah. So yeah, bang, bang, <laughs> bang, and it takes too long for the <laughs> bling, 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 you know, for all those notes. The, the Bucky's, it's just two little notes moving back and forth. Always, always. That's his key. Cool. I'm glad you told me that. I really listened for that. I know you had uh, a nice part in the uh, Mel Tinton uh, tribute CD. That uh, I saw your name in there. With a nice thing to say. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. That's right. Oh, that, the one he recorded. Yeah, that right. song has not been recorded yet. That uh, tribute. That, uh, no, I was. Con that's not what I was talking about. But I know you had a nice sentiment in the, that double CD they put out. Had that nice book in it. You know, right, and so right. And I, I put in a poem in it, which yes, is actually right. a song, which uh -huh. I've been per had performed at his 80th birthday. Right. I'm able to keep track of Milt's birthday perfectly because he, he is 30 days to the day older than my wife. Oh. So, when when. She has a birthday, card. he has a birthday, and, I, and he's 30 years older. Right. 
Well, yet somehow she's 50 years younger. Now that that, that is, is an interesting bit of. I think as you should write a song about that too. Right. <laughs> He's 30 years older than she, but she's 50 years younger than him. That's she pulls it up every year. <laughs> well, this has really been fascinating. I'm well, looking forward to talking to you and. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. And I, I wish you the best with uh, your myriad of projects and. Working yeah. the vowels and the consonants. And oh, there's so much to stuff. do. <laughs> so little time. <laughs> there is so much to do. So little. See, there's no D's in there. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you very okay. much. Thanks for your Monk, time. Appreciate man. it. Okay. Bye.